This recording continues the lecture over cirrhosis that talks about the complication of preventing and managing hepatic encephalopathy, and it will continue on to discuss care coordination and transition management for the patient with cirrhosis. So let's review again, what is hepatic encephalopathy? Hepatic encephalopathy is a decline in brain function. So when you see that encephalopathy, we're talking about the brain that occurs as a result of severe liver disease. In this condition, the liver cannot adequately remove toxins or ammonia from the blood. Since the, remember the liver's function is to sort of, um, it metabolizes things and it acts as a filter. And when it's not working right, toxins and ammonia can build up in the bloodstream that then gets sent out to the body when it should have been cleaned out, if you will, um, and it can affect organs, including the brain. The, the liver not being able to remove those toxins causes a buildup of toxins in the bloodstream, which can lead to brain damage. So again, with hepatic encephalopathy, we're worried about toxins and ammonia building up in the bloodstream because the liver isn't functioning well and leading to brain damage. Because ammonia is formed in the GI tract by the action of bacteria on protein, non-surgical treatment measures to decrease ammonia production include dietary limitations and drug therapy to reduce bacterial breakdown. So let's first talk about nutrition therapy for the patient. Um, with cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy. So your patient with cirrhosis who has no signs or symptoms of hepatic encephalopathy, so they have um, problems with their liver, right, but they haven't accumulated high levels of ammonia in their blood. They have no signs and symptoms of hepatic encephalopathy. So the patient just with cirrhosis, their diet recommendations are high carb, moderate fat, high protein diet. When the patient then, when the cirrhosis progresses and the patient starts having elevated serum ammonia levels, as well as signs and symptoms of hepatic encephalopathy, the nutritional therapy for the patient changes. Because remember, ammonia itself is a waste product made by the body during digestion of protein. So when the liver was functioning well enough and there was no elevated ammonia, ammonia in the body, the patient with cirrhosis had a high protein diet. When that cirrhosis progresses and there's elevated serum ammonia, signs and symptoms of hepatic encephalopathy, the dietary recommendation are moderate amounts of protein, oh, typo here, fat, and simple carbs. So um, again, protein breakdown is what leads to ammonia. So when the patient starts building up ammonia in their bloodstream, it makes sense that we change from a high protein diet to a moderate uh, protein diet. And we're not able to just strictly restrict proteins um, because proteins are needed for healing. So the patient does have to consume proteins and is still going to get proteins as nutrition, but we will decrease the amount if the patient is accumulating ammonia in the blood. Obviously, we'd want to collaborate with a dietitian um, regarding nutrition therapy. Uh, brief, simple directions regarding dietary do's and don'ts are recommended. We want to keep in mind any financial, cultural, or personal implications in the patient's food allergies when discussing food choices. Next, we'll move on to talk about how drugs or medications are used to manage hepatic encephalopathy. So drugs are used sparingly because they are difficult for the failing liver to metabolize. If you think back to your first lecture in pharmacology, we talked about the pharmacokinetics of medications. Um, how they work in the body and how the body affects them. We talked about how the liver's job is to metabolize medicine. So with the patient with cirrhosis whose liver isn't functioning well, we'd be worried about giving them medications that the liver then can't metabolize, right? And then they'd start accumulating those medications um, and they could accumulate to toxic levels in the body. In particular, opioids, analgesics, sedatives, and barbiturates should be restricted, especially if the patient has a history of encephalopathy. One drug that you'll hear frequently being used to treat um, elevated ammonia levels, elevated serum ammonia levels, is lactulose. And when you think of lactulose, I want you to think of lactulose, laxative, liver, ammonia. If you can group those four things together, um, 
that'll be good in terms of test taking or when it gets prescribed for a patient. So lactulose can be prescribed for a patient who's constipated because it is a laxative, but it's also prescribed for patients with those elevated ammonia levels. Uh, because the medication lactulose promotes the excretion of ammonia in the stool. The medication itself is a viscous or thick, sticky, sweet tasting liquid that can be given orally or by an NG tube. The purpose is to obtain a laxative effect. Cleansing the bowels may rid the intestinal tract of the toxins that contribute to the encephalopathy. It works by increasing osmotic pressure to draw fluid into the colon and prevents the absorption of ammonia in the colon. The drug may be prescribed to the patient who has manifested signs of encephalopathy. Um, so again, lactulose, think of it as a lact laxative. If the patient is having problems with their liver, the laxative will help um, rid the body of ammonia. Since laxative is since lactulose is a laxative, we want to monitor the patient may have intestinal bloating or cramping. Um, we also want to monitor for hypovolemia and dehydration as a result of excessive stools. Several non-absorbable antibiotics may be given if lactulose does not help the patient meet the desired outcome or if he or she cannot tolerate the drug. I'm not worried about you knowing the specific names of the medications, but just that these non Absorb, absorbable antibiotics are being used. These medications destroy the normal flora in the bowel, diminishing protein breakdown and decreasing the rate of ammonia production. Long-term use has the potential for kidney toxicity and therefore is not commonly used. Um, when treating the patient, whether with nutritional therapy or with drug therapy, you want to continue to monitor the patient for changes in level of consciousness and orientation. Uh, monitor for asterixis, which is that hand flapping, or fetter hepaticus, which is that um, liver breath, fruity, musty odor that you can see, um, because these signs suggest worsening of encephalop encephalopathy. So just with any medication, you want to monitor that it's working correctly, and if you see signs that the patient's getting worse, you have to notify the physician. And then finally, um, again, Alcoholism is associated with cirrhosis, so if a patient is hospitalized and starts experiencing alcohol withdrawal, thiamine supplements or vitamin B1 supplements and benzos may be needed uh, for the patient who is at risk for alcohol withdrawal. In regards to home care management, the patient's rest area needs to be close to a bathroom because diuretic and or lactulose therapy increases the frequency of urination in stools. If the patient has difficulty reaching the toilet, additional equipment such as a bedside commode will be necessary. Incontinence pad or briefs may be helpful if the patient has altered mental status and incontinence. If the patient has shortness of breath from massive ascites, elevating the head of the bed and maintaining him or her in a semi-fowler's or high-fowler's position may help alleviate respiratory distress. For the patient who has an, a tunneled ascites drain, so they're able to drain their ascites fluid that has accumulated on their own at home, they need to be taught how to access the drain and how to remove the fluid. Uh, we want to make sure that we review home care instructions that are provided with the drainage system with both the patient and the family or caregiver. And it's important to remind them not to remove more than 2,000 milliliters from the abdomen at one time to prevent hypovolemic shock. So that's important patient testing. If they're gonna be using an ascites drain at home, do not remove more than 2,000 milliliters from the abdomen at one time. And the concern is if they did, the patient is at risk for hypovolemic shock. The patient with encephalopathy often finds that small, frequent meals are best tolerated. Uh, patient may have supplements um, such as Ensure, those are usually needed um, to make sure their nutritional intake is sufficient. We want to teach the patient to avoid excessive vitamins and minerals that can be toxic to the liver, such as fat-soluble vitamins, excessive iron supplements, and niacin or B3, vitamin B3. The patient is often discharged while receiving diuretics. 
So we'd want to talk to the patient about the specific diuretic they're receiving, um, let them know about signs and symptoms of hypovolemia they need to be watching for, and also if they need to take a potassium supplement, the importance of taking that along with the diuretic that they've been prescribed. In terms of self-management for the patient with cirrhosis, you have a nice chart in your textbook that goes over nutrition therapy, drug therapy, and alcohol abstinence. Under nutritional therapy, it says consume a diet that adheres to the guidelines set by the physician, nurse, or dietitian. Again, nutrition therapy can change a little depending on the patient's signs and symptoms. If you have excessive fluid in the abdomen, follow a low-sodium diet. We know that water uh, is attracted to sodium, so that makes sense. Eat small, frequent meals that are nutritionally well-balanced. And include in your diet daily supplemental liquids such as Ensure and a multivitamin. In regards to drug therapy, take the diuretic or preventative beta blocker as prescribed. If you experience muscle weakness, irregular heartbeat, or lightheadedness, contact the healthcare provider. Take the medication prescribed that helps you prevent GI bleeding, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Take the lactulose syrup as prescribed to maintain two or three bowel movements every day. Do not take any other medication unless specifically prescribed by your healthcare provider. And again, that goes back to if we have problems with our liver, we're going to have problems metabolizing those medications. Um, in regards to alcohol, do not consume alcohol and seek support services if needed. So let's talk really quickly about a couple other medications. So if the patient has problems with bleeding from gastric ulcers. The healthcare provider may prescribe one of those H2 receptor blockers or proton pump inhibitor to reduce acid reflux. Patients who have episodes of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis may be on a daily maintenance antibiotic. We want to teach family members to recognize the signs and symptoms of encephalopathy and to contact the healthcare provider if these signs and symptoms develop because obviously it would indicate a worsening of the cirrhosis. We want to reinforce that constipation, bleeding, and infections can increase the risk for encephalopathy. We want to advise the patient to avoid all over-the-counter drugs, especially NSAIDs and hepatic toxic herbs, vitamins, and minerals. Remind the patient and family to notify the healthcare provider immediately if any GI bleeds is noted so reevaluation can occur. One of the most important aspects of ongoing care for the patient with cirrhosis is to stress the need to avoid acetaminophen, alcohol, smoking, and illicit drugs. In terms of healthcare resources, the patient with chronic cirrhosis may require a home care nurse for several visits after hospital discharge. The encephalopath encephalopathic patient may need to be monitored for adherence to drug therapy and alcohol abstinence. Individual and group therapy sessions may be arranged to help patients deal with alcohol abstinence if they are too ill to attend a formal treatment program. Because, because some patients may have alienated relatives over the years because of substance use, it may be necessary to help them identify a friend, neighbor, or a dot in the recovery group for support. 